Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best day movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. I'm sitting at the table with a couple of soon-to-be unemployed guys. <laughs> also, here's John Schnapp. Hey, this because John Campia said, I don't want you to make those funny voices. I was like, Campia, what are you, what's wrong with you? Why he you tried to put the lockdown down on Petey Peppers and Tony Ravioli. We said, hey, Giovanni, you're Italian. We're you're the roots. Really, what's going wrong? I'm going to send you a croissant right now. Come on. And watch <sighs> this little trick. You make me so tired. <laughs> that was Christian Harloff. That was Christian Harloff. <laughs> and that's Christian Harloff. Hi. <laughs> <All right>. Wow. <laughs> We're off to a flying start today, aren't we? Hey, guys, thanks for joining us on the show today. we got a whole bunch of stuff to dive into, so actually, let's get into it. If the prospect of seeing every hero in the Marvel Expanded Universe team up against Thanos in Marvel's Avengers Infinity War has you over the moon with excitement, prepare to get even more hyped. In a new interview with the Toronto Sun, Infinity War filmmakers the Russo brothers hinted that there still might be a chance to include the Netflix super team known as the Defenders. We do consider everyone. We don't want to get too specific about what's going to happen with these movies. We want these movies to be a surprise for audiences. Avengers Infinity War is scheduled to be released on May 4th, 2018. John, do you think the Russos are seriously considering adding the Defenders in some way to Avengers Infinity War? No! No, they're not! You gotta be plastic man to stretch this far. When somebody says, hey, well, you could put the Defenders? And when they go, well, we're considering everybody. That's all they said. There is no way. I mean, look, anything is possible. We've learned that in the movie world. Anything is possible. But look, they've seen, be besides the fact, between the split that we've had between Feige and Perlmutter, which those two dudes are not on each other's Christmas card list anymore, right. and one runs television, one runs movies, and the fact that in the Netflix universe, they've seemed to go do an awful lot to kind of separate themselves, not disassociate, but separate themselves from the movie universe. Like, they, there are barely any references to the expanded Marvel universe. They're very, very vague and very, very subtle, unlike the Ages of S.H.I.E.L.D. and unlike, say, the other movie universe, so they'll just right. directly talk about Captain America or whatever. And they've created their own really cool thing. And I don't know... Let's say they do do it at some point. For whatever reason, they do do it. It's difficult, I think. It would be very challenging to take, say, a Jessica Jones in this very smaller scale, gritty, grounded world, suddenly have her fighting alongside Star-Lord, and then to bring her back into her television show and maintain that awesome, gritty feel that Daredevil Luke Cage is going to have, that Jessica Jones aspired to. It would be a really challenging thing to do. I don't see how you do it and make it work. I think the Netflix series have a great thing going. Leave it alone. It's doing great. I think the movie universe is going great. Leave it alone. Don't interfere with it. I, I just can't see. And the statement, it doesn't sound at all like they're actually seriously considering it. But like I said, man, anything is possible. Schnepp, you hear these comments. What do you think? It's funny because we've we've gone back and forth about this possible like would they show Coulson or you know all right, the other yeah, yeah. possibilities and for the most part you know I've been on the yeah I don't think they're gonna mix it up and for the reason of that the Netflix universe is so, it works so well and it's ground it's grounded for, as far as superheroes go it's like you know Daredevil's got Hell's Kitchen looks like the Luke Cage uh, series is gonna be set in Harlem they, they're like kind of they have their own city block that they're protecting and it's a smaller stakes type of a thing yeah and I think even with the defenders it's gonna be dealing with the hand the return of Electra a lot of these kinds of things that they have to you know unite together to, to even perhaps maybe just save New York not the whole world but you know you saying that I just got like a chill I was like you know what would be cool in all the comic books when they ever want to do something like Swamp Thing just, you know, became one with the trees. All of a sudden they showed like, you know, you know, all the other mystical characters like looking up in the sky or sure, something. Sure, like a quick cameo shot of I some thought sort. If there yeah. was something with Thanos <clears throat> meeting death or some gigantic cosmic, you know, some trigger event where all the different, you know, you know, characters with superpowers or ultra senses, like they could show Daredevil like looking up or people would go ape shit. Right, that just happened, that limited. Just that, you know, like something happens on screen, it has like ramifications across the entire universe and they just show everyone take pause. It could be like Drax eating a sandwich. You know what I mean? <laughs> Any way that you could do a quick cameo like that but showing the connected Marvel Universe without having to drag everyone into that scene 
I'd love to see that. See, I didn't think there was any way to really do it. You just convinced me there is a way to do it. Limited and small, yeah. but that would be cool. I don't know, Christian, what do you think about That's this? That's where I was going with it because I think that for me, it's a matter of uh, you, you can do this. And I think that the statements alone doesn't mean that they're working on it. You're absolutely right about that. But I think that it would be interesting. And, and even more than just a little cameo of someone looking up eating a sandwich, they could do something to where it's the three of them together in that kind of world. But eating a shawarma. As, eating shawarma. <laughs> but, as long as, but as long as, like you said, they're not put together with someone like the Guardians right. or fly, next to Iron Man as he flies by because it, you're, it would be a little jarring to go then go back to that kind of gritty realism that they do in Netflix. But right. if they're all together and it's a separate scene where they're doing something together real quick in that world, almost to where it almost seems like a scene out of the, the Netflix series mm -hmm. inside of the, uh, the, the Infinity War because that's how big of an issue it is because the question would be, what are they doing right now? What are they? they? They do have abilities that would certainly help. I mean, Daredevil is certainly someone I'd rather have him on my team than Hawkeye. No offense to Hawkeye, but I mean, that's mm. so there are there are things that they could be doing to help. So I think it's something that they are considering, not so much to where because the guy asked the question is like, no, we're working on it right now. It's right. the deal's going down yeah. next week. But I wouldn't be surprised if something like that happens. All right. What's next? THR reports that 20th Century Fox has purchased the life rights to Stanley's story and aims to bring it to the big screen. The project will not be a biopic, but rather an action adventure story with Lee as the main character, with THR using Kingsman and the Roger Moore led James Bond movies as a template for the tone of the movie. No actors or release date have been set. Christian, what do you think of a Stanley action adventure biopic in the vein of Kingsman? I don't know. This is such a uh, bizarre, weird, interesting story that I kind of really want to see it, um, especially in the vein of Kingsman. I would like to see Jason Lee play Stan Lee, uh, not just because <laughs> nice. of the last name, but just because of the fact it just takes me back to Mallrats. Mallrats. Granted, it's it's 22 years later or whatever it is. And he's got experience playing a comic. Did he play a comic book guy in Chasing, Chasing Amy? Amy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. But he just, he, you know, he's pretty well versed in, in the mythos of uh, mm. Stan Lee and still young enough to play a young Stan Lee. Got to nail that New York accent. Yeah. Though, man. I, my, <laughs> my daughter right now is listening to the Audible uh, uh, Spider-Man in the car and it's so good. And like Crusher Hogan. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just gonna be, he's the best. True believers. It, it's yeah. so good. But yeah, this would be what a way to do it. It's I would have been interested in seeing an actual biopic also. But if you're gonna do it like this and you're gonna have just a strange, bizarre movie with Stanley, I think that it's really gonna play towards us and like the hardcore fans because I don't think the casual movie fans, are, oh, a movie about Stanley kicking ass, cool, I want to see that. The trailer might make them do say that, but just hearing about it, right. we are all gonna be like, that's interesting, that's weird, that's bizarre, what is it gonna look like? But it's, it's, I feel like it's just a tired statement to where it's, I can't wait to see the trailer. Peace comes to the world, <laughs> an end to world hunger, a Stanley action adventure <laughs> movie, the three greatest pieces of news we could possibly get today. I almost lost, I mean, Mark Riley came into my office, said, John, did you hear about this? And sat down and told me about this last night. And, and then I, he was fired. And I know, I just thought, <laughs> I was like, quit lying to me, kid. No, yeah. it, I am losing my mind over the excitement for this. You know, we also talk about a little bit more on Heroes a little bit yeah. later today. But I mean, when, when you stop and think about it, the first thing I thought was in Glorious Bastards. When Quentin Tarantino takes real life people, real life event, so you're, you're the Nazis, Hitler, all that kind of stuff, but completely turns it on, on its ear and goes in a totally different direction. The idea of Stan Lee in his 40s, already by this point in the mid 70s, a well-known name. Mm -hmm. People know who Stan Lee is, but as soon as the lights go down, he turns that little bust head on his desk and a secret door opens and he right. picks up the screen, talking to the President of the United States because he's got to go save the world once again. I mean, I just think that the potential for this is so great. So great for a bomb as well. But forget that for a second. Abraham Lincoln. I, oh, yeah. No. This huh. could be outstanding. I'm really excited about this. What yeah. do you think? Stan Lee, secret agent. You know what? I hope they call it the origin of Stan Lee. Like, I hope they, <laughs> they, they do treat it with this kind of fun where yeah. we were talking about this. Like, I found out about this. We shoot heroes in the morning. I couldn't, I couldn't even believe it was real. I was like, what? <laughs> This is crazy, and we started just spinning off like Excelsior is actually the name of the sp the secret uh, organization, like Spectre. But Nuff said is like the uh, you know the the ship that they fly around, and there's a whole bunch of different fun that they can have. And in fact, Stan Lee used to have this kind of fun all the time in the '60s and '70s. He's the guy who created that bullpen feel when he right, did the, yeah. the letters comment, like, "Hey, write us in at the bullpen." He made it part of the family. He made it a fun adventure. Him and Jack Kirby would like imagine like in the back of the comics that Doctor Doom showed up and like 
like Doom was telling them, you wrote me wrong, and they'd be like hiding, and all kinds <laughs> of funny, breaking the fourth wall things happened back in the 60s, and Stanley was doing that constantly, talking to the viewer, addressing them, the view, the, the readers. So I think he's the original uh, Deadpool, if you want to really call him yeah. that. I, so I, I love that they're embracing that characterization of Stanley and bringing it full circle, making him actually like a secret super agent as well as a comic book writer. I love the idea. You brought up something really cool in a com when we were talking about this earlier because you were saying like, what if like Stanley is like, like it airdrops into Russia and he sees like to steal some kind of technology and he comes across a guy who calls himself the spider. It's like, <laughs> Spider-Man! Uh -huh. yeah. That it's in the midst of these adventures that Stanley comes up with some of oh, his ideas. Oh, you're definitely going to have moments yeah. like that. <laughs> that guy looks like a Hulk! <laughs> 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 An incredible Hulk. Yeah, hey, wait right. a minute. That's yeah. incredible. All right, folks. Well, listen, it is Wednesday, which means it's time for us to do a little bit of Rewind, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is a segment every week where we celebrate the movies celebrating their 10th anniversary and their 20th anniversary, starting with the movies turning 10 years old this week. We've got The Black Dahlia. We've got The Gridiron Gang. And we've got... The Last Kiss. Moving on to the 20 year anniversaries, we got, I can't believe this movie is 20 years old. Is that a typo? First Wives Club, holy crap. Um, we got Last Man Standing, and we've got The Big Night. Schnepp, let's start with you. Which of these six movies stand out to you? My favorite is totally Last Man Standing. That is like <laughs> a badass film. It's, you know, it's, it's like a Western. It's a remake of a very famous films that you've seen before, but it's done with such violent integrity. I've loved Christopher Walken in it. I think it's one of Bruce Willis's best roles as a badass. It's so much fun. It's directed by Walter Hill. It's unapologetically violent. I love it. Definitely check it out if you just want to see a gritty, violent Western, but takes place in the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Prohibition days. Christian. Last Man Standing was one I was going to bring up because it also was like kind of one of the last, uh, it's when you started to see, oh, Bruce Willis, he still got it. And then the, the next couple ones after that, maybe he doesn't. Right. Um, <laughs> but for me, it's Black Dahlia, and I'll tell you mm. why. Because I remember when that movie came out, I was really excited to see it, and it was a letdown. Mm. It was mm. complete letdown. It was boring. Some of the performances were okay. And I just remember it, there was kind of a lot of buildup on it initially, and then I just, I, yeah, I just remember really being underwhelmed after seeing that film. Mm. You know, uh, I, I was also going to mention Last Man, but you guys talked about it. First Wives Club was a film that I remember thinking oh, this looks dumb and and then it's actually kind of funny it's a nice charming funny little comedy but the last kiss when it was brought up to me that the last kiss was celebrating its 10th anniversary it jogged me it's like why does that stand out to me oh yeah that's right 10 years ago this week if you got that picture let's bring it up 10 years ago this week Paramount invited me to the Toronto International Film Festival because I was still living in Toronto at the time and they asked me if I wanted to hang out with Zach Braff for the evening and shadow Zach Braff. And it was, first of all, it's a charming little movie. Zach is every bit as cordial and polite and entertaining and fun and funny. And actually, bring up the picture just one more time for a second. I don't know if you can tell, if you look closely into the eye, that is the eyes of a really drunk guy. <laughs> Zach, at this point, was kind of blasted because that's late into the evening of the party. And he's one of these guys, when he starts drinking a little bit, his charmingness and his humor and everything intensify. And he just became even more charming and more welcoming. It's just absolutely one of the coolest. I will always have a soft spot in my heart for Zach Braff because yeah. just how cool he was that evening. Uh, but it was a really with a great soundtrack, by the way. Last Kiss has a really good soundtrack. Check it out. It should be on YouTube if you haven't had a chance yet. All right, folks, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Director Peter Berg was recently talking to Collider Steve Weintraub at TIFF 2016 about his next movie, Deepwater Horizon, when he revealed he still has plans to make a rundown too if given the chance. Here's what Berg had to say when the sequel was brought up. We've been talking about it. You know, I wanted to do it with Kevin Hart and Dwayne Johnson. If I could get Jonah Hill, I'd do it tomorrow. If I could get Dwayne and Jonah Hill, I'd do it tomorrow. Schnapp <laughs> Byers sell a rundown too with The Rock and Jonah Hill. What if he can get Kevin Hart tomorrow? Would he do it tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, man, I guess I'd buy it. I, we're Stifler. Come on. I, I liked him in uh, The Rundown. I, I, I really found The Rundown an enjoyable, fun action film. Uh, I would love to see a rundown too with any of this cast, so I'll buy that. Yeah, I mean, I I sell it because, yeah, what about Sean William Scott? Sean William Scott yeah. was great in that movie. I thought the rundown, that was coming, because Christopher Walken 
was kind of the villain, the baddie in that one, right? I barely remember who the baddie yeah, was. I, just I think remember, it was like, Christopher Walken. The, I remember the, hanging from a, a, a rope, and then there was like a whole sequence where they had to fight a bunch of dudes in a circle. It's just, it's a charming, fun little movie. I want to hear with Sean William Scott coming back. I mean, hey, Jonah Hill right now can do almost no wrong. Like, I just, what's that one War you just do with Miles Teller? War Dogs. He is... He might be getting an Academy Award nomination for it. He was incredible in War Dogs. So yeah, I would I would see this, but I'm only going to sell just because I want to see The Rock and Sean mm. William Scott back together again. Yeah. We don't know if Sean William Scott is not going to be in it at all. He just said he'd like to also have Jonah Hill in it. Okay, uh, fair enough. Because, fair enough. you know, Sean William Scott, maybe he has a smaller role. Maybe that's not the story that he wants to tell this time, and, and he shows up. But I do like, I, I'm going to buy the fact that Jonah Hill and The Rock together would be interesting because yeah, they're both be doing these things where... They both can play comedy. They both can hit dramatic chops. Peter Burke can do both of those things as a director. Um, so to add those up, and I think that there's such kind of the before and after with with The Rock and Jonah after uh, Jonah Hill. So it's so funny in general. So I think that could be something that really works. And I also hope that they have Sean William Scott involved in some <laughs> way or another. But the addition of Jonah Hill and The Rock, yeah, I'm buying it. Well, you know they want to do it because Burke confirmed that they've got a script. And it's been ready for a couple of years now. And by the way, too, I've also talked to a couple of people now who have seen Deepwater Horizon, Berg's newest film coming out here with Marky Mark. Everybody I'm talking to who's seen it says it's amazing. That's what I heard, wow, too. Really? So, yeah, keep your eyes open for Deepwater Horizon. All right, what's next? Variety reports that Jason Clark is in negotiations to star opposite Helen Mirren in the horror thriller Winchester. Michael and Peter Spierig are directing the film from their screenplay with Tom Vaughn. The film follows firearm heiress Sarah Winchester, who's convinced that she's haunted by the souls killed at the hands of the Winchester repeating rifle her husband invented. After the sudden deaths of her husband and child, she throws herself into the construction of an enormous mansion designed to keep the evil spirits at bay. John Byersell, Jason Clark, alongside Helen Mirren, in deep in Winchester. <laughs> Sorry. And Deepwater Horizon. Yes, I one. buy this. You put this dude in anything right now because in the past like four or five years, Jason Clark has kind of dropped in and like this weird eclectic group of films and every time he fits right in and he's good, he's talented, he always brings it. And this story we talked about a little bit the other day about just the story of the Winchester House, which is a real place you can go and visit. I am fascinated by the story. Adding him as like the psychiatrist is going to go and mentally evaluate her because maybe she's going crazy. This sounds like a great pairing him and Mirren together. Aces for me, it's a buy. It's a buy for me, but you blocked out of your memory uh, Terminator Genesis. Uh, and now that wasn't his fault. That was not his fault. That was though. not his fault, but he didn't make the movie better. Uh, because well, it, maybe it would have been worse without him. I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> what, what they did with that movie? They, I thought they they actually wasted him, and they should they shouldn't have done anything with that character the way that they did. But definitely not his fault. I am a big fan of Jason Clark. As you guys know, horror is not the one that I'm always super excited about, depending on who you put in. And I have been saying this year, I thought, has been one of the best years for horror films because of the, the approach, the James Wan approach, if you will, by going after the top tier talent and really putting together stories that don't just rely on the jump scares and everything else. And this seems to be another one that's trying to do that. Jason Clark and Helen Mirren. OK, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's that's something that I could totally be into for sure. I like the team up. I'm sorry. Ray Ora. He does a crazy thing. He apparently he's saying it. Ray Ora is saying in the chat board, talking about that picture of me and Zach Braff. Ray Ora writes, I photoshopped that pic. John has met everyone in this industry with my help. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Schnapp, what do you think? I like that picture of a drunk Zach Braff. Good job, Ray. Um, I'm going to buy this. I, I, I buy Helen Mirren. I buy the Winchester crazy house that the original lady actually built. I want to see the Spearg brothers knock it out of the park. Ever since I saw them do Undead, which you haven't seen, highly recommend it. Uh, they've got a, a bunch of other films that they've done. Nothing that's topped that one to me so far, but they have a really good grasp on doing crazy kind of paranormal stuff. They're really good with special effects. I think this sounds like, you know, oh, this crazy old woman building these weird doorways to nowhere. But what if those things that she's building them against are real? Yeah. That's what's fun. And you put in the, uh, Helen Mirren and now you got Jason Clark. I think he's a great actor. I have to say he's what made the first 20 minutes of Terminator. First Genesis, 20 minutes. Sure. Salvageable. Sure. I, I'll sort of. There. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's a good actor. And if they went a different way mm -hmm. when they went back to 1984, did a, they, there could have been an incredible Terminator film in there with I the cast. With you. That they you know had. what he was really good in recently? I, I 
forgive me, the movie about Everest. Was it called Everest? Yeah, yeah. he was yeah, really yeah. good he was in that movie. So good, yeah. in and that. the one with uh, Shia LaBeouf and uh, Tom Hardy, the uh, Lawless. Oh yeah, oh, Lawless. That's right. And then there was also that he recent... disappears into films. I mean, he was yeah. also in uh, the John, uh, the Planet right. of the Reason Dark Thirty, yeah. Yeah. which he was really sharp. And yeah. I mean, just he, he's he's this guy who is an A list, top notch superstar, but we still don't think of him in that. In that he's way. a character. You know what he was yeah. really good in that we definitely think about it was White House Down. Not White House Town, the other one, Olympus Has Fallen. Olympus Has Fallen. Olympus Has Fallen. Oh, see, I haven't mm. seen either of the White House I like Olympus, yeah. he was good in that. Well, All right, what's next? One of the more well-received movies at this year's Toronto International Film Festival was the Jackie Kennedy biopic Jackie starring Natalie Portman. Critics are universally praising the film, and now Fox Searchlight has secured domestic distribution rights to the film for a very friendly December 9th release. The story, sorry, a very Oscar-friendly December 9th release. The story recounts the hours and days following John F. Kennedy's assassination, focusing on its impact on the First Lady, Christian Byrasel, Jackie as a serious awards contender based on its new Oscar-friendly release? That's a loaded question. It's hard to buy it as a serious contender because I haven't seen the movie yet. Um, but as far as the date goes itself or where they move it, I'm going to buy that it's a contender because we're in the time period to where these movies are starting to be screened. They're starting to get reactions. They're starting to get the buzz. And this is also a movie to me that Natalie Portman will lock in. And when she locks in, she is money. Like, yeah. you, like there are times we can definitely see there are many times where you've seen her in the big blockbuster movies and you're like, she was not present. Right. Just whatsoever. say the word prequels. I was going to say Thor. Sure. I was going to say oh, Thor. Yeah, she's going to watch um, that but one. She, wasn't, she just wasn't locked in. But you take Black Swan right. or anything, or a movie like this to where you can say, I mean, she right away, I, I don't even, you don't have to tell me what it is. And I see the picture, I know she's Jackie O, obviously. Right. So this is something that I think because of the date, the fact that it's December 9th, they want to start to get the buzz out before award season. Yeah, I buy that it's going to be the talks. Schnepp. Yeah, I'm going to buy it too just because of the buzz. Like, uh, you know, from the screenwriter winning awards to now the buzz at TIFF. Uh, you're right. Natalie Portman, when, she, when she's in really good material where she can, like, get into it, she, she, I love Black Swan. So, and Aronofsky was going to originally possibly direct this as oh, he's wow. just on as a producer. So, um, looking forward to seeing it. I don't know what they're going to, what part of the, I guess, uh, the, uh, the days following his assassination where she's, like, you know, withdrawn and dealing with the horror of that. So, I mean, it sounds like it's going to be pretty intense. I've I've got to buy this for a couple of reasons. One, I, since Black Swan, we have been waiting to see that Black Swan Natalie Portman right. again. You know, and they, I had hopes for that western she just did. Jane oh, got right. a gun. Jane got, got a gun that yeah. went through all the nightmares and problems, and it didn't turn out to be the film I was really wanting it to be. But I get really excited when a studio picks up this film. They say, no, 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 no. You, the studio shows we got confidence in this because you know what we're going to do? We're going to plant this right in prime Oscar you know, in a prime Oscar fertile field right there in December. That says a lot to me. Hearing the reviews coming out of TIFF is huge, and it sounds like we're getting that Black Swan Natalie Portman back again. I have a question, because now this is Fox Searchlight. Now, with the, what I will say about TIFF before I start this point, with Birth of a Nation, which basically got uh, the, the buzz happening again at, at TIFF. Right. Because we knew the problems and everything that it was having, do you think that maybe also, because we knew that Birth of a Nation was Fox Searchlights, that was their front runner. That was the one they were really pushing with. Because of the issues and the problems that maybe Birth of a Nation had, do you think that maybe they're giving a stronger push to Jackie now too? It's an, it's, it's an understandable question to raise, and I think it's valid that you're wondering that. I don't think so. I just think they know you know, we can load this thing. Right. Like, we can really tip the scales in our favor here with these two big powerhouse, very different types of films sure. together and really make a name. Because, you know, these studios, they really do struggle to make names for their subsidiary companies, whether it's Fox uh, Fox Searchlight, Paramount, uh, what was it, Vantage at Paramount, or Cla mm. Paramount Classics, what, Sony Classics. Oh, yeah. Uh, Paramount, it might, I think it's Vantage. Anyway, uh, for these companies, if they can load in two heavy hitter, high potential movies, that just goes well for the, for the yeah. company. Yeah, yeah. All right, what's next? Yesterday was the 20th anniversary of the death of legendary rapper Tupac Shakur, and to commemorate the occasion, a new trailer for All Eyes on Me has been released. The movie is directed by Benny Boom and stars Demetrius Ship Jr. as Shakur. Shanette Byers saw the new trailer for All Eyes on Me. I love the trailer. It was, uh, it was really just like from beginning to end. I was entranced by it. It just was. Full, it had a flow. It had a you know all the visuals are there. It's it feels like it's touching on all the important aspects of Tupac's life and unfortunately his death. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. I'd love to see you know, how they tell the story. So they've got me with the trailer. It's a big buy. Christian. It's a huge buy for yeah. me because they're going, because they, 
the different when they did um, Straight Outta Compton. Great movie. Mm -hmm. I really. I know that you didn't like the second half as much, but like the movie. Oh, I no, thought, it's just just like the final twenty minutes. Yeah, but I thought that it that movie was for. I mean, my mother in law saw the movie. I really enjoyed it, <laughs> and you just see this this push. <laughs> I think that this movie is a lot more is a grittier movie, and it needed to be obviously mm. with with Tupac Shakur and this guy. What's his name? Demetrius Ship Jr. Is that his name? Yes. Yeah. Where did he come from? This guy looks exactly like yeah. Tupac. I mean, it was uncanny. Like I couldn't believe it when I was looking at it. And he got the voice down. He got the way that, that Tupac spoke. I am really interested in this movie. I can't wait for it. I thought the trailer was incredible. You know, when the Straight Outta Compton trailers came out. They just floored me. They just absolutely floored me. And aside from the last 20 minutes of the film, which I thought they lost their way a little bit, I thought it was a wonderful movie. F. Gary Gray did such yeah. a great job sculpting that movie. When I heard this Tupac movie was coming out, I got so excited. I got to tell you guys, I, I saw the trailer. Wow. Mm. I felt it was a very sloppy trailer. It felt like the production value was very low. A lot of times it didn't even sound like, it sounded like they were using microphones on, on cell phones. Mm. Uh, I, it sounded like the production value just wasn't there. It felt disjointed to me. I'm not sold on this guy, like Benny Boom, who's directing the film. He's no F. Gary Gray. Mm. I mean, the, the first, it may, may only be the only major release film he's ever done was Next Day Air with Donald Faison. Remember how bad that movie was? Nope. That, that's probably the same thing. It too. was a bad yeah. movie. Yeah. And so look, much like yesterday, I bought the trailer for the new Fifty Shades, even though I know the movie's going to be bad. But hey, just call like I see it. The trailer looked good. So even though the movie's gonna be bad, I got a feeling this movie's gonna be really good. I think I got a feeling this movie's gonna be special, but I, I gotta say I was let down by the trailer. Mm, it so just I'm, didn't grab you. Yeah, yeah, the trailer didn't didn't grab. Felt did a little feel sloppy a little to bit me. More VOD for you. It felt a little VOD. That's a great yeah. way to put it, actually. All right, folks. Well, listen. Today is not the only show today that's on Movie Talk is Movie Talk. That's not the only show here on Clyder Video. We got a couple other great ones. As we mentioned a little bit earlier, Heroes. The new episode of Heroes is going to drop at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 5 p.m. Eastern. Keep your eyes for that. And also the newest episode of the Top 10 show. And the topic of this week's Top 10, female-led comedies. That drops at 5 Pacific. Uh, that'll be 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So keep your eyes open for Heroes and the Top 10 show a little bit later today. Also, don't forget, we do Movie Talk Live. So if you're watching us live right now, first of all, make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. And if you are, you can start firing him some questions because we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. Wendy is back there. She is the gatekeeper, so make sure you kiss up to her a little bit if you want your question on. But first, we're going to get to some mailbag questions. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. we got two questions picked out today. So, Ashley, what do we got? Philip Weinland writes, My kids love Charlie Brown and the Peanuts. They like the TV specials before, but got hooked after watching the Peanuts movie. I thought it did pretty good at the box office and critics seem to like it are they working on a sequel i to the best of my knowledge they're not i have not heard them working huh. on a sequel but let me i'm with your kids i thought peanuts was a damn good animated film i thought it was charming i love the way they blended the old style of peanuts with the modern technology and animation did they do some of too much of the red baron stuff yeah probably but everything that came back to charlie brown and his story at the end of that movie when everybody's gathered around that school bus i got choked <laughs> up i thought it was a wonderful film I'd be totally on board for them to do another one. But to answer your question, as far as I know, they're not working on a sequel. Christian, have you heard anything? I thought I heard that they were working on a I sequel. I hope you're right. I think, like, right after, because the success was pretty good. And I'll tell you what it did really well was it brought in people who obviously were nostalgic about it. Sure. And you see it. But my daughter saw it. She's four and a half years old. She was three and a half at the time. And she loved it. And that was kind of her real first mm. introduction into Charlie Brown. And she's watched it like two or three times since. And it was a really great way because you said it was, it was such a great family film. And it was yeah, a movie that you wonderful. could take kids to of all ages uh, to see and still enjoy it and have that feel good. Um, this person's not human. She hates Hot Charlie I Brown. Do. Wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What? What? Wait, wait. Uh, yeah. Mrs. You like Charlie Brown? Mrs. Hates Fromstein him. has a question for Ashley. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Fromstein. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly like, why is that funny to people? I don't understand that. Why don't you that? like JTE? I mean, Charlie Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Peanuts, Peanuts reminds me of your teacher trying to relate to you. It's raining outside. You can't go out for recess. So what does the teacher do? She puts on Peanuts because she thinks that that's what kids like and I don't like it. We <laughs> gotta watch the new one. I'm telling you, it's so good. What it's would make so me, good. Why would I like the movie if wait, I wait, don't wait, wait. like Peanuts? Hey, did you, have you seen the Halloween special with Peanuts? I think I probably Where he, has to, yeah. he like, walks yeah. around with a bag of rocks. Yeah. With the Great Pumpkin? The Great Pumpkin, Charlie it's Brown? It's not funny. 
Oh. All right. Well, you know what? It must be generational. And then now the new kids are, are, are well, going to be the introduced old one, to this. You watch the old one, and it's going to be hard to get kids into. Because I, like, I did try to get my daughter to watch the older ones. Didn't hold her attention as mm-hmm. much. But the new one, it's it's shot in that kind of the new animation style, mm-hmm. but it still brings in a really endearing story. I'm telling you, you should give it a shot. The new okay. One. You, you didn't see it, right? Okay, no. 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 I see as an adult seeing it and having grown up as a little kid watching the Charlie Brown you know, cartoon specials, they did suck more as they kept making them. Like the <laughs> yeah, first few did. were great, yeah. and then they just went down in animation uh, standards. And even Schultz hated the animation team. He called it the Blandishment Group. Mm. Like if you watch the credits, the animators aren't even called animators. They're called the Blandishment Team, which is horrifying. Like <laughs> he had such vinegary hatred towards oh, animation. Wow. But that's not even the point. I, I agree with you. There are way too many Red Baron scenes for myself. But kids loving it makes me happy. I'm like, that's it's made for them. And like, as an adult, I was like, I liked some of it. Some of it I didn't like. I thought, you know, I agree. There was way too much. I was like, why is a fifth Red Baron sequence? What the hell is going on? But if the kids loved it, that's all that matters. So I certainly hope they're working on a sequel. And you know what? The, the other thing this movie did was they stayed incredibly true to the personalities of Absolutely. each of the characters. Yep. Like 100% they yep. stayed uh, like fair to them. Well, they didn't try to change it up. And that was one of the biggest complaints. I remember when The Muppets was, was, uh, was Jason Segel. Totally. Um, and I liked that movie the first. But oh, first so do what, I. There was yeah. a lot of like the, the behind the scenes stuff was that The Muppets and the people behind The Muppets Jim Henson, not not a huge uh, fan over there. Henson of the way that they were kind of switching up and changing mm-hmm. a lot of the characters and characteristics. So yeah, you're right. All right, what's the next mailbag question? Pedro Nabias writes, "Greetings from Portugal, Collider Crew. Last year I found your channel, and now I can't spend a day without watching one of your videos. Oh, thank you. My question to you is: Do you think Fox should partner up with Marvel? With the last X Men and Fantastic Four movie not being so great, and with this new rumor of a secret Agent Stan Lee movie, what? it seems like Fox is going through a rough patch. I think a collaboration with Marvel would benefit them and possibly revive their franchises. What do you guys think? Okay, first of all." The news of a Jim, a Stan Lee movie is not an indicator of a rough patch. Right. That is genius. Yeah. Okay, let's get Secret that Secret agent right. Stan Lee, Excelsior, baby. Um, and as far as a rough patch, well, yeah, X-Men Apocalypse wasn't great. And, and look, and It the made fans, a lot of money. It made a lot of money. And with the Fantastic Four, I mean, they've been stumbling on that for a decade Ever. now. Yeah. But I mean, uh, how many films in a row requires a rough patch? Because right before that, you had X-Men Days of Future Patch, which was amazing. You had X-Men First Class, which was amazing. You had Deadpool, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. So I would not say Fox is in a rough patch right now. You know, this is a discussion about whether Marvel should either a give the X Men characters back to Marvel, or now in the light of the Sony deal, should they partner up with them? And uh, you know what? I still, despite the fact that I'm not a big fan of X Men Apocalypse, their last three films before that, Deadpool, Age, or uh, um, Future Past. Days of Future Past, and First Class were all stellar to mm-hmm. me. I think they were stellar. And here's the other thing, too. Like, a lot of people think, oh, you know, if everything was under Marvel's, everything would be good. No, look, I I don't want 50 characters in every single movie. I, I just don't want that. And also keep this in mind. If the X-Men properties were under the Marvel umbrella, Deadpool would have never happened. It would have never happened had it been there. And that's one of the reasons why I always like the idea of comic book properties being spread out over multiple studios. Some studios, like Marvel, will do it better than others, Mm -hmm. say Fox. You know, they they some studios will do better than others, but you're gonna get more diverse, you know, tones of films, more diverse styles of films. And sometimes you're gonna get real great diamonds in the rough like a Days of Future Past, like a Deadpool. Whereas if they were just all working with Marvel or under Marvel, they're all going to be the same. And you know what? The fact that Fox makes X-Men movies the way they make them, it makes me appreciate the Marvel movies a little bit more for their, what makes them unique mm-hmm. and vice versa. So, I mean, personally me, hey, look, conglomeration seems to be the, bi- the big thing right now. It could happen sometime in the future, absolutely. But I like things being spread out to get more studios working on things. And plus, you know, we're getting five, six, seven, eight, nine right. comic book movies here right now. Who doesn't want that? Yeah. I want it. So I don't know. Schnepp, what, how would you answer 100% that? hundred agree with you because like just two years ago, I remember going to the, to the AMC theaters and seeing Amazing Spider-Man 2, 
uh, Captain America, Winter Soldier, and X Men: Days of Future Past, all playing in at the, the same, same theater at the same time. You could have done an incredible triple feature. Maybe one of those movies sucked. The other two were awesome, but it doesn't matter. You get the you get the the choice, and you get like seven or eight films. As opposed, to if it was all Marvel, if it was all Disney, you'd only get three tentpole films a year, and you'd get less characters and you get less diversity. So I think I like that Fox has the X Men. Would I like to see a team up of Wolverine on the Avengers? Sure, but I think that is uh, less so than having a f the freedom of having Deadpool, X-Force, New Mutants, and X-Men all coming out next year if Fox decided to, or if they still want to make Gambit, or if they want to make a long shot movie. They don't have to worry about crowding their field because they're not in charge of all those other characters like the Avengers or Captain America or Thor or Hulk or, you know, 100 uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, all these other characters who want to have their space set down for their summer movie. Mm. I think it's great to have that freedom. Now, Spider-Man lost that freedom because of the stumbling of the films. So I think it made a lot of sense for Sony to like, let's make a deal with Marvel, bring Spider-Man into the Which fold. Was one character. One character, yeah. and I think it worked great. I'm glad it happened. I don't want that to happen with any of the other characters except for Fantastic Four. I think that yeah, Fox has had their Fox has the had their <laughs> chance for multiple, like over a de like almost two decades now, and it's just not working out. And I think that 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 group that Fan, that Fantastic Four family that launched the Marvel universe, that the comic book universe. That was the first comic that belongs at Marvel. And whatever Marvel has to do, Marvel Disney has to do with Fox to make it cool. Like let let Fox have the, the toy rights back to fan to the X Men. Let's just make it a cool universe. I think Fantastic Four belongs in the Marvel universe, and X Men's doing great because X Men has their own universe of yeah. mutants, and it it just works that way. So I think I don't want to see them integrated. Christian, yeah, I mean, uh, listen. They're not in a rough patch right now. Yeah. You know when they were in a rough patch? Was right after both The Last Stand and the Wolverine Origins movie. Yeah. If this conversation would have happened then, we would all be singing a different tune. Mm -hmm. But like you said, you start off when, because when First Class came out, I mean, I was like, yeah, oh, what was this the end of X-Men? And it certainly wasn't. It was the rebirth of yeah. the X-Men. Yeah. And, and then you have Days of Future Past, and then you have Mangold's Wolverine. Uh, you have all these, and then you're going to have the rated R Wolverine movie. That movie's going to crush. Deadpool, crush. Deadpool 2. You don't need to make it doesn't that would be way too crowded to put it into Marvel right now and like you said Shep there there is the X-Men universe now that they're building off of and because of the success of Deadpool they can build even more so and they're going to do so much more within because there's so many characters and there's so many new powers that it's essentially their own Marvel Cinematic Universe right there that they can use I'm also with you guys Fantastic Four needs to get back to Marvel, you got you just got to. It's 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 not working over there. It hasn't worked with the Tim Story version. It, ha, it didn't it didn't work now um, in this in this past version here. Sony was in dire straits. They they didn't have a universe. They didn't have anything. The, first, the I I'm with you. I liked the first Amazing Spider-Man. Oh, I liked it very the much. The yeah, second, second one, one, it's abysmal. Um, and I remember seeing it the first time. Going, oh, this is uh, not great, and it's it's terrible. I've seen it again recently. It's I don't know why I did that to myself, but um, <laughs> but the movie itself, uh, they, they just they had to give it back. And but what they did, the deal that they made was able. They're still now Sony's still going to profit off of it. It was a mm. smart move and a good business decision. Is there a way Fox can do that now with Marvel? Maybe, or maybe not. Maybe they just lose the, the characters altogether. But Fantastic Four needs to go back to Marvel, and I believe it will. And the other like, variable in this we cannot discount is that with the Spider-Man situation, Sony as a whole, the company as a whole, was in real oh, yeah. financial the leaks. Yeah, And the leaks trouble. and everything, and too. The leaks, yeah. it, it was just a mess. Fox is not in that position. They're actually right. in a position of strength at this point. All right, folks. Well, I said we're going to save some time at the end of the show to take some of your Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now listen once again make sure you're following us on twitter at collider video fire in your questions wendy's been back there collecting some so wendy what do we got box office jack says speaking on peanuts what comic strip not comic book do you want adapted into either a movie or netflix styled series calvin and hobbs oh, absolutely calvin and hobbs and i know that'll never happen never because he won't so i'm just gonna go with the far side i think if you took some of those funniest, like just do an anthology series and just like almost like Robot Chicken, but with the Far Side, that could be pretty. But it would incredible. have to be a with Far Side would have to be instead of like Robot Chicken, a series of two minute sketches. It would literally have to be a series of fifteen seconds. No, I'm with you. Little bits, yeah. Fifteen second bits. They would just you. They would kill. They would crush just seeing that animated pan downs or side pans or whatever. I think that would be a fantastic. You know what they tried to do an animated series with, and they didn't do it well, but I still think the comic strip lends itself to it if they did it right. That's Dilbert. 
Mm. I, like Dilbert as a comic strip, it might be my like, they, number I two or number three favorite. That as an That's what I'm saying. Yeah. They tried it. It yeah. didn't quite work the way they did it. Right. But I still think the material is rich enough, and it's a funny enough strip that it, if you ever read Scott Adams' book, Scott Adams actually writes some really funny stuff in his books. The Smurfs. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> actually, Dilbert, like if they if they use if they tried it again, but like applied the Office Space. Technology, like you know, whatever, like Office Space is Dilbert. Pretty much has live Dilbert action. in there, yeah. yeah that's Dilbert pretty much in is, there. Yeah. So it's like I feel like the Dilbert animated series just didn't work. Ashley, because, do you have what's your favorite comic strip? I have to laugh because do you remember when I asked you how to say Calvin and Hobbes? Oh my God, I was that's a that's throwback. What, like right when you said that, that's what it reminded <sighs> me of. And I read it afterwards; it was so cute. I would love to see that. I was really into Calvin. I Hobbes. have got to dig up somebody. Please put in a link in the comments section with the time reference to that mm -hmm. way back in the AMC closet yeah. days when I, I asked you before the show though so I didn't say it on camera was it no are you sure it wasn't done on camera yeah I wasn't done on camera oh cause I remember <laughs> I remember the look on my face when you I said I was like, like is it Hobez like what is this you it. haven't read Calvin and Hobbes yeah, <laughs> you should have said it's Calvine and Hobez right. <laughs> Calvine and Hobez alright what's next uh, Canadian Pat 493 says hey guys which actor do you want to see come back into a prominence a la Michael Keaton my pick would be Steve Martin. Steve Martin's a good pick. Steve Martin's oh, yeah. a great pick. And that actually, as soon as the question was starting to be asked, my mind went right to Steve Martin. Not like, going to happen, but Rick Moranis. Oh, uh, if he wanted to. Yeah, yeah he but wanted it's, to. All, it's his call. That's, yeah, that's, well, that's, why, that's why I said it's not going to happen. I say Jerry Lewis has one movie left. In him. <laughs> Come on. Oh, Jerry, Jerry Lewis. Lewis. Um, gosh, I'm just trying to maybe. You know what? No. Ted Danson's got a new TV right. show. Uh, so, th so that doesn't really count. Oh, speaking of Ted Danson uh, from Police Academy. Oh, Steve Gutenberg. Steve Gutenberg. That'd be mm. good. Yeah. Steve Gutenberg. It's the same it'd, be dramas. it'd be interesting. Yeah. Is he is he still doing? No, dramas no, no. Or? I said it would be good if you I see would, him. Start yeah. I would love to see Steve Scott Gutenberg Bacula. just play himself, like he did in the episode of Party Down. Uh -huh. Like he's just Steve Gutenberg, and he's just like, yeah, it's just me, Steve Gutenberg. Let's hang out. I would watch a show about Steve just hanging out with Steve Gutenberg. You know what? He's already had three resurgences. Hasselhoff. Yeah, one nice. more Hasselhoff research. Speaking of another double research, I'd like to see a Travolta. Another one from oh, Travolta. Oh, yeah, because he came back from he the did, dead once yeah. in his And career. then I'd also like to see whatever coma Bruce Willis has been in, I'd like to see them wake him up from that. Oh, and, and the obvious one. You were I were about to say the same thing, I bet. Sam J. Jones. No, but that's a great one. I was going to say, I'm still Flash is what his show should be so called. Good. And it should be a reality show because I, I got a chance to meet him at one of these conventions a couple weeks ago. He is so awesome. He's super nice and he's funny. He is yeah. just a funny guy. One actor that when he's on, he's one of the best in the world and has just been ugh, Nick Cage. Oh, yeah. I would love to Since see Snowden. Nick Cage. Can I, can I suggest, because I, I suggested this to another uh, company before, I was like, get Nick Cage and Carrot Top oh, yeah. and Vince Neil. Yeah, All buddies. three of those guys hang out in Las yes, Vegas together do. and they wear the same orange suits. That would be the most incredible reality series ever made. It would be like the Three Amigos is what I was calling it. Get Terror like, Top away from the buffet table. It would be, I swear to God, that's just, I just gave you millions of dollars. It would be the dollars. first yeah. reality show that I would actually watch. I would, everyone would I watch would it. I would tune in Carrot to watch that. Top, yeah. just think about this and then look it up online because this is real. I'm not making this up. Carrot Top, Vince Neil from Motley Crue and Nick Cage all hang out together right. in Las Vegas and have parties and drink together. Vince Neil's going to jail. Like they though, have so it? much fun. He is. <laughs> yeah. some, shit, some shit got real right. in a bad way, but he's yeah. going to pay for it. And then he, when he gets out, yeah. three amigos, stay tuned. Starts with him getting out of prison. Damn straight, <laughs> man. Prison break. They're all waiting for him in the car with the orange right. seats. It's perfect. <laughs> Why did you do that? Oh, my God. I want to see that. All right, so let's take two more. All right, Venom says, any guesses for the next boss level villain for Marvel after Thanos? I feel like Ultron would come back and be more threatening. I don't think they would do that. No, I, I, I mean, I, if if they didn't treat the third act of Age of Ultron the way they did, I would say, yeah, I would totally be up for an Ultron. Where it almost feels like after Thanos, you have to reduce the stakes a little bit, don't you? Like, I what think, do you think? Well, look, I mean, if if like what we all want Phase Four to be Phase Fantastic Four, it's Galactus, it's the Silver Surfer, right? It's all Galactus, that, that cosmic makes sense, stuff. Yeah. If they don't do that, we've got an entire other universe called the Kree Skrull Wars. That stuff involves everybody in the Marvel Universe. So I don't know if, I mean, Thanos is his own thing, and I think that Infinity Wars is gonna be its own thing, but then they're gonna develop, I think they're gonna drop Skrulls in there. If Gunn isn't already introducing Skrulls in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, we know he's a giant nerd. You know, he can't wait to have, Ego the Living Planet is a main <laughs> character in Guardians of the Galaxy. No one, don't tell me you know who Ego the Living Planet was unless you read those <laughs> Thor Kirby classics. I mean, that's an obscure character, so Gunn is all about scraping those obscure characters. 
the Skrulls are not obscure, and they deserve a place in the Marvel Universe. So I think it, the Skrull Kree War is going to happen. Uh, for me, I mean, because you, you're bringing up the big, the big baddies. I, I want to see a really kind of developed bad guy, and I hope that Claw, the Claw is one of them. Mm. I hope in Black Panther that they do mm. bring Claw back, because we saw him in Ultron. Let's, For let, sure. let's see him do more. Uh, it, Michael B. Jordan's character, someone also I, I'm curious about what they're going to do in Black Panther, so maybe they introduce some brand new bad guys that way. I don't necessarily need just the, the epic big, huge ones, because you're right. After Thanos, it's either, you're either going to have to scale back completely, or you're going to have to go ten times, so we'll see how they're going to do it. And remember, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, they teased at it there's a real Mandarin out there, right? That would be I'd be interested. I would to love see. That, the Ten Rings yeah. Society, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Also, remember, AIM actually exists. They've hinted at it in Iron Man yeah. Three. Uh, we can get Modok, the crazy giant head floating around yeah. Modok. I mean, that would be pretty crazy. All right, last Twitter question of the day. All right, A Clay says favorite acting <laughs> performance so far this year. Mine is John Goodman in Ten Cloverfield Lane. Yeah, Goodman was really good in that. Um, I might have to go with Ben Foster yeah. in uh, Hell or High Water. Yeah. I mean, that, that performance so was just I thought, like... Almost, I, thought, I swear to God, I know you wouldn't have said it. Ben Foster as a sorcerer in Warcraft. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was like, are you, are you going to say that? Of course not. Of course not. I don't know why I instantly went there. I loved him. He was one of the redeeming factors of Warcraft to me. But yeah, What about I, you? What would be some of your strongest wow, performances? Ben Foster and Chris Pine. And, and Jeff Bridges. And Jeff Bridges. All three of those guys. Yeah. Hell or... Hell or High Water is an incredible movie, and it's all about character. I love that film. Yeah, I mean, that. my first choice was Ben Foster, but I'd also go with, um, man, I can't remember the, kid, the guy's last name, Jack uh, from uh, Sing Street, the brother. Oh, right, 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 yeah. Um, right. I think that he was really great in that movie. The kid, the lead kid was really good. Yeah. So you, you want to pull from Sing Street, you want to pull from Hell or High Water, and you got no complaints from me. Definitely. All right, folks, well, that'll do it for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, I want to make sure you guys know that the most important part about the show is not what we have to say. It's what you have to say. Please jump into the comments section and leave your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discuss here today. We read just about all of them that get put in there. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And this weekend here in Cali, Long Beach, comic-con we're doing a collider heroes panel definitely check that out also uh schmoes a whole bunch of collider people all doing a giant panel a bunch of different panels at kamikaze definitely get your tickets there and then if you're in new york comic-con we're going to be doing a collider heroes panel on thursday so that's the flavor that's happening Sitting to my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, and me shutting up that human gas bag that is the outlaw John Roca on uh, Friday for the Schmodown. You know, uh, Schnepp had mentioned the Kamikaze. I'm trying, not confirmed yet, I'm going to try to get an actual live Schmodown happening at the Kamikaze, so stay tuned. Oh, it's, it's going to happen. Oh, and also Heroes tonight, I hope, like today. Dropping in a couple hours, almost forgot. Regardless of what John Shep says, it may happen. We are trying. <laughs> Sitting at the end of the table, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you reading Calvin and Hobbes? And Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. Miss Wendy Lee Zaney. Wendy, where can people find you? On Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. A special thanks to all the guys behind the cameras here, and special thanks to you. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys watching our show, so thank you very much. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name's John Campion. Until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.